This idea that the church is hiding something, that, which we would have to say as two apostles who have covered the world and know the history of the church and know the integrity of the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve from the beginning of time, there has been no attempt on the part in any way of the church leaders trying to hide anything from anybody. Now we've had the Joseph Smith Papers. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism. Radio Free Mormon. Here we are again, another episode, Mormonism Live. And today we are talking about the thing that is unspeakable. We are going to talk today, my friend, about the second anointing. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's really interesting because I, I felt like appending to what Elder Ballard was saying. We've never hidden anything from anybody not except for the second anointing. Thing. Yeah, not a not a damn thing have we hidden in, in this church. As these two guys know all the history of the church and and the workings on and all these leaders, not a not a damn thing. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, the second anointing is a classic example of something that they know about that they're hiding and that they have taken steps to make sure that members don't know about it. Yeah, why don't we start off? Let me say this too, by the way. Um, I'm just going to go to uh, right now, people giving to our YouTube channel. We're up to about $7,000, 7120 bucks. Uh, why don't we set a goal tonight? Why don't we see if we can reach, what do you think is a fair number? 500 bucks? 20,000. 20,000? <laughs> I mean, think big, Bill. Think big. How about 1,000 bucks? Do you think we could try that? Uh, sure, sure. Let's, Let's set a goal to raise $1,000 in tonight's stream. Um, as we put on the show, uh, let's start off here. I want to, I kind of put this together and you and I talked about the way we grew up understanding the second anointing and the way I understood it was that someday when I read Bruce R. McConkie, when I read Joseph Fielding Smith, when I looked at the encyclopedia on Mormonism, which I went back and revisited for tonight, um, what I came to as a young, uh, adult who had been a convert to the church was that. Someday, if I kept the commandments, if I busted my ass, if I was the best Mormon I could be, uh, at one point, someday, I would be walking down the street or sleeping in my bed, and suddenly the Son of God himself, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, would show up, and he would tell me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have essentially achieved, um, you've proven to me that you, have, that you are celestial kingdom material, and uh, your exaltation is guaranteed, and I would have <clears throat> my calling and election made sure. Is that is that your understanding of how it was too? You know that could still happen, Bill. Just so you know, <laughs> I I think if the church is true, that's slim to none. Don't discount it completely. All right. There. No, no, mine is a little bit different though. <laughs> I mean. There are two aspects to this, and I will tell you that, uh, of course, because I was very interested in Mormonism and read teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith before I went on my mission. Uh, you know, there are just a few little clues out there that are tantalizing, that are available to the regular LDS reader. And there's a couple of them in there. In fact, one of the main quotes comes from there. And basically what I had always thought based on that is that, yeah, walking down the street, having done everything I'm supposed to do, uh, being a good missionary, doing everything. And then a voice comes to me and it's the voice of God. Mm. And it's like out of nowhere. And the voice says, um, you made it. You're in like Flynn and you will be exalted. I think that's what Joseph Smith says, that the voice will come saying, son, thou shalt be exalted. So women need not apply because the voice is only going to say, son, thou shalt be exalted. Seriously, though. That's how he puts it. But right. there's a voice and a verbal confirmation from deity that you will now be exalted, that you've made it. You've passed the grade. You don't have to wait to the judgment day someday in the future to find out. You can find out right now. But there is also closely connected with that. And apparently shortly after that, that you receive the appearance of Jesus and you see him. You get to talk to him face to face. Um, you kick back together on a 
Sunday afternoon and he shows you some visions of eternity. Yeah. And, and very similar. We understood the gospel or this part of Mormon theology in very similar ways. As you and I were studying for this, we had to read all of these kind of uh, correlated curriculum materials, including Bruce R. McConkie's Mormon Doctrine, which is quoted in correlated curriculum. So hence, it has the stamp of approval, at least on this definition. And yet there's this idea that one gets their calling and election made sure, and then one receives the second comforter, which is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And I'll just put up on the screen here an example of one of these. Um, this is uh, the Encyclopedia of Mormonism. An exhortation to make one's calling and election sure is found in Peter's writings, associated with the more sure word of prophecy. The prophet Joseph Smith explained the more sure to word of prophecy means uh, a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life by revelation in the spirit of prophecy. Is there any way for you to blow that up at all? Oh, yeah. Let's see if we can do that. Uh, Maybe it's my eyes, but that's kind of small for me to read. Hey, let's try that. Okay, okay. I think that's better. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. The prophet Joseph Smith explained the more sure to word of prophecy means a man knowing that he's sealed up into eternal life by revelation, the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. It goes on and on there, but these are the kinds of things that you and I ran into. Um, and then there was this thing, which I'll blow up as well. And I remember this. I remember a teacher once in a class, she probably wasn't supposed to read it. Oh. But do not attempt in any way to discuss or answer questions about the second anointing, right? Like here's the teacher's manual. This is the old curriculum, but not that old. This was just done away a couple of years ago in favor of the come follow me. Um, this is how we frame it. We don't want the class talking about it. We don't want them knowing about it. We don't want to have a conversation about it. We're not going to answer your questions about it. Um, I think we'd also have to be honest. There may be some of these questions that there is no answer to. Right. Yes. Those are going to be the ones we avoid. Those are the ones they're avoiding. And uh, this one they know the answers to, and they're avoiding this one too. Any thoughts you know, on kind of not being allowed to talk about it, the references being ambiguous, as you pointed out? No, I just wanted to bring up the fact that really, as I was uh, developing in the church and learning, as much as I possibly could about the church, there are a plethora of phrases that are basically synonymous with this idea. And second anointing is one of them, but that's one that I never heard of early on. What I heard was the other four, and they basically have to do with having your calling and election made sure, uh, the more sure word of prophecy, those were mentioned, um, the second comforter, which Joseph Smith talks about in association with that, um, there's the second anointing. And what is the fifth one? Do you know what it is? Calling an election, second comforter. I have it here. No. Uh, oh, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Holy Spirit of promise. And by the way, there's another one, which is code, which I only found out relatively recently in the last few years, which is receiving a fullness of the priesthood. Ooh. Because that's what that means. Receiving a fullness of the priesthood means you got your second anointing. And by the way, if you see it in the scriptures, and you will see it in the scriptures and the Doctrine and Covenants, that's what it's talking about when it says a fullness of the priesthood. So uh, me in the church, I never received the fullness of the priesthood until I received the Wait a second. Let me rephrase that. Nobody in the church receives a fullness of the priesthood until they receive their second anointing. Nobody in the church receives the fullness of the priesthood until they receive their second anointing. Right. Yeah. Oh, we have a quote on that too, by the way. Is it okay if I go to that? Please. Okay, um, I'm just, uh, this is from 1901. So this is Joseph F. Smith. Don't forget the F. And this is an Anthony W. Ivan's diary. Of course, he was a counselor with him in the first presidency. Sixth so, president of the church, by the way, Joseph F. Smith. Well, thank you. Very good. So this is what uh, Joseph F. Smith had said. No man receives a fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood till he has received his second anointings. Mm. So when the fullness of the priesthood is spoken of, we ought to recognize that the top leadership of the church has all this code language and to some degree probably has it worked out and to some degree probably fumbles over it too. Um, but to recognize anytime that word is used, that phrase is used, that maybe your ears perk up and you go, what are they talking about here? Yeah. And this expression dates back to Joseph Smith. Yeah. So... Um, I wanted to point out too, just this is kind of unrelated to the second anointing, but I thought it was important as we were delving into this topic. I'm going to get rid of this 
and make this just a little bigger. A couple of quotes. This is still the same chapter, chapter 19, Eternal Life, where they ask you not to talk about the second anointing. But in the supplemental resources in, this, in the teacher's manual, there's a couple of quotes here. Ordinances, right here, ordinances instituted in the heavens before the foundation of the world in the priesthood for the salvation of men are not to be altered or changed. All must be saved on the same principles. RFM, which of our ordinances have not been altered or changed? Not sure I can come up with even one. We were talking about this on the phone the other day, and you said baptism. I maybe baptism. I said commissioned. Yeah, you have authorized, right? Right. So authorized, authorized is what it was originally in the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Moroni, and the word having been authorized uh, of Jesus Christ is now having been commissioned of Jesus Christ. So even that ordinance has been changed in that regard. By the way, that quote is from the manual, but who is it quoting? Um. That quote, I th I don't know. Did you know who it was? No, can you go back up to it? I'm sure they'll give a reference at the right bottom. Uh, it, they don't. Uh, oh, teachings. Yes, it is. It's Smith's teachings. Teachings yes. 308, 309. Teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. There we go. Um, so all or ordinances cannot be altered or changed. Now, here was the other one I thought was really interesting. i got to find it here really quick. Uh, right here. Look at this. Mm-hmm. The elect of God comprise a very select group, an inner circle of faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They are the portion of church members who are striving with all their hearts to keep the fullness of the gospel law in this life so that they can become inheritors of the fullness of the gospel rewards in the life to come. Bruce R. McConkie. Uh, Mormon Doctrine, page 217. I looked that up, and it does say that exact same quote. Um, so there they are quoting Mormon Doctrine again. That really makes it like it is a super special insiders club, doesn't it? It is, and there's a lot of perks, believe me. There are a lot of perks. You get a special secret decoder ring. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you get to use that. And, uh, your and own that's, seer stone? And that's about it. Oh, your own seer stone. Oh, maybe. Someday. I may be divulging too much here. I don't know. No, it, I, I think we're teasing people with false information. So <laughs> and we got to be careful about that because there's a lot of stuff here that may sound unbelievable, but is true. So I yeah. don't want to confuse it too much. But this has been my experience in the church looking at the correlated materials. Anytime they even come close to talking about the subject, what they do is they throw in a few quotes that raise more questions than answers and don't really say anything concrete and make it all fuzzy and hazy. And maybe that's the, the whole point. But what they definitely don't and never do is say that the second anointing calling an election made sure is an ordinance that is performed in the temple that the only people who know about it are supposed to be the people who have received it. And even those who have received it are put under strict injunction that they are not to tell anybody else about it. So it's supposed to be kept secret from the membership at large. This is not just super secret squirrel stuff. This is super sacred squirrel stuff. Yeah, and you pointed out, I mean, uh, the dialogue article that you and I both pulled some of this information from made mention that the, the brethren were aware of this one guy who got a second anointing who went around blabbing about it in church meetings. In and Idaho. And what did the brethren do to respond to that? They stopped doing the second anointings yeah. for decades. This was like in the 1920s. Yeah. So if you talk about it, which we're doing, shh, don't don't tell anybody we're talking about it. But if people did talk about it, the church doesn't like that. They don't want this thing spoken of. Well, no, they have to gone to great lengths to keep it a secret. Uh, but at the same time, you've got Elder Ballard proclaiming that they don't keep anything secret from anybody. Nothing's hidden. And he's so, by the way, just to make it clear and underscore this. Yeah, he's received his second anointing. <laughs> he knows about it. He received it. <laughs> he's. He's had it. Um, he knows there's secret stuff. He knows there's uh, things that are kept hidden. Um, and in fact, he knows that there's some things in the vault still that haven't come out yet that I'm aware of that haven't been published. I did want to run through for just really kind of at a high level um, how the second anointing developed and came into existence. So I'll make a couple mentions here. First, uh, 25th of October, 1831, the Office of High Priest was created with a new revealed power to seal. It always seems as though Joseph says, here's the new thing, we got it, we nailed it. And then, you know, three months later, another new thing comes out to kind of surpass that. Um, number two, 
1832 and then formally established in 1833. Bill, Bill yes. can I interrupt? I'm so sorry. Yeah. This is one of the things about um, getting your calling election, make sure you're second anointing, okay, is that it's not just an ordinance that you receive. You're, you're sealed up. You are assured of your exaltation unless you do something really atrocious. Well, I'm sure we'll get to that in a second. But, but also involved in that is giving to the person who received the or receives this ordinance the power to seal. So that's another, that's the connection there that you're talking about with high priests and they were given the power to seal in 1831. That was one of the component parts of it. That ends up getting sort of overlapped into or flowing over into uh, getting your calling election made sure. I don't think that the your regular high priest in your ward, that there aren't that many of them anymore since we got rid of them. I mean, my gosh, these are the guys who could seal things in heaven and have them sealed on earth or sealed in earth and sealed in heaven. Now they're basically gone with the wind and now all we have is the elders horn. Right. But I don't think that any of those high priests can actually seal anything. It's not part of the package anymore. They can seal a blessing on someone's head that has no magic power at all, but that's about it. Right. And there you get into another part of the problem, right? We use the word seal in so many ways. And right. in fact, sometimes I start thinking maybe it's used in so many ways in order to sort of hide what it is that it really is. Because a sealing means stuck together with uh, super strong glue, crazy glue, forever. Yeah. That's really what it's about, being sealed forever and being sealed up, in this case, unto eternal life. Right. Perfect. Uh, somebody asked if if all sealers in the temple have had the second anointing, it would be very safe to assume that all temple presidencies have had the second anointing only because Tom Phillips and Hans Matson, which we'll get to a little later, um, both mention the temple president or a counselor in the temple presidency being highly involved in the ordinance, and hence they obviously would have received it themselves. In uh, 1832, and then formally established, established in 1833, Joseph Smith created the School of the Prophets, where no one was to be admitted unless he was clean from the blood of this generation. That's another piece uh, that plays into the second anointing. Blood Number and sins. Three, what's that? I was saying blood and sins. So yes, yeah. I love that part. Uh, in the Kirtland, upon the, uh, com I'm sorry, before the completion of the Kirtland Temple on the 6th of February, 1836, Joseph... Uh, called the anointed uh, together. So he took the people who had been had their feet washed, had been anointed, and he separated them from the rest of the Mormons. And he basically said, you guys are extra special. So there's some recognition of kind of taking that group out from the larger group and, and acknowledging their specialness. Number four, as early as June 1839, Joseph Smith introduced the idea of calling an election made sure uh, he did this in uh, in Nauvoo as he continued to expand Mormon salvation concepts. Uh, in June 1839, uh, in a sermon, he added the notion of a comforter, and he pulls that, I think, from John 14, 26, which he defined not as the Holy Ghost, but as the personal manifestation of Jesus Christ himself. Right. Well, this is where in John chapter 14, uh, where there's this extended dialogue with Jesus and the apostles in the upper room before he goes off to the garden, right? Uh, where he talks about the comforter, right? All the Holy Ghost scriptures that we get out of that uh, that extended uh, discourse. But after talking about the comforter, right, the Holy Ghost, then he talks about another comforter, mm. right? There's another comforter. And, he, and Jesus says, um, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's what it says in the New Testament there in John chapter 14. And that's where Joseph Smith riffs on that or expands upon that and says there's a second comforter. And the second comforter is Jesus himself. Just like he said in the New Testament. Oh, right. <laughs> um, number six. Uh, this looks like maybe January 1841. Um, he announces another revelation joseph smith does where he asks uh he's he's putting it in the voice of the lord he says how shall your washings be acceptable unto me except ye perform them in the house which you have built to my name um anointed saints were thus advised that their Kirt kirtland ordinances were forerunners to other ordinances to be revealed after a temple was completed in nauvoo as before however these ordinances were revealed in advance by the prophet to a select group of church leaders and their wives. 
the, quote, quorum of the anointed or, quote, holy order. Uh, this action provided uh, providential. This action proved pr providential as Joseph was killed well before the temple's dedication. Number seven, May 4th, 1842, Joseph Smith gathers nine men. James Adams, Heber C. Kimball, William Law, William Marks, George Miller, Willard Richards, Hiram Smith, Newell K. Whitney, and Brigham Young, and instructed them in the principles and order of the priesthood, attending to washings and anointings, endowments, and the communication of keys pertaining to the Aaronic priesthood, and so on to the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood, setting forth the order pertaining to the Ancient of Days, and all those plans and principles by which one is enabled to secure the fullness of you hit it, of those blessings which have been prepared for the church of the firstborn and come up and abide in the presence of Elohim in the eternal worlds. Now, there's some room to doubt this account. The dialogue article explains that uh, the account leaves out the name of two people there, and those were the only two who apostatized later. And so there's some uh, argument that maybe this account was edited um, at some point after Joseph Smith's life. And we do know that Brigham Young had a tendency to do that at times, yeah. editing some of the early documentation to make it more uh, helpful. Also friendly. Yeah, more more friendly to the Quorum of the Twelve taking over leadership of the church. And right. again, I'll point people, apostolic coup d'etat on Radio Free Mormon. Um, one, By the way, also, Bill, yes. when you're reading through that, did you notice the highest order of the Melchizedek priesthood? The highest order of the Melchizedek yeah. priesthood. And number eight, May of 1843, Joseph Smith first teaches that the celestial kingdom contained gradations within the highest gradation reserved solely for men and women who entered into the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. So now we're learning that not only are there three kingdoms, but the highest kingdom is parsed out into three kingdoms as well, or three areas, with the highest being reserved for those who entered the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. Number nine, I just want to make note, this is all running side by side with polygamy and the initiates receiving these rituals are almost entirely the same people involved in knowing about and being involved in polygamy and keeping it secret. And these ordinances seem to be a useful way to bind these folks to secrecy. Any thoughts from you on the theological advancements um, that laid out the groundwork for this ordinance to, to, to be created? I want to just try and hit a few things too, and you've already covered them. I didn't have as many as you, but if uh, what I did was I tried to take statements by Joseph Smith or revealed through Joseph Smith and put them in chronological order from 1829 with the Book of Mormon all the way up to 1843 with Doctrine and Covenants section 132, okay? And what I did find out as I was doing that was that there appears to be a definite progression of this concept that it begins by being something that would happen while you're at work, while you're walking from point A to point B. And then you hear the voice saying, you made it, you shall be exalted. And that seems to be consistent up to up through 1839, where there's another statement that Joseph Smith makes that tends to sound like that. But it's after 1839 and the subsequent statements in the 1840s in the Nauvoo period, where it appears that this calling an election being made sure becomes ritualized and it becomes something that is performed in the temple and that the leaders of the church therefore have the ability to control who receives it and who doesn't. Yeah, no, and, and very much the case. I mean, they're constantly policing as you say who gets it and they don't want everybody to they don't want anybody who receives it to know beyond the people that they go with that day who else has received it they wanted to make sure that they prevented future denver snuffers from being able to make claim on leadership of the church by essentially making this into a ritual and now you have to go through the president of the church for this thing to happen yeah there's a really interesting aspect of this which i'm not going to go into just so you know about the ordinances or the things that have to happen for you to be exalted that initially some of those are outside the control of the church like this idea of a voice coming to you and telling you you shall be exalted well what are you supposed to do when joe schmo from down the street comes up and says i heard the voice so i guess i'm exalted 
No, that's too loosey goosey for an institution. So over time, they take those ideas and they institutionalize and ritualize them within the church and especially within the temple. Now, really quick here, Book of Mormon, 1829, it's being uh, dictated by Joseph Smith, Helaman chapter 10, verses four through seven. This is the famous account, at least all his missionaries sure knew about this account, because this is one of the later Nephi's. He's walking along and he's doing everything he can. And in, what is it, verses four through seven? where the Lord comes to him and says, hey, I've seen how you've been knocking yourself out, uh, being a good missionary, and you've tried to keep your commandments and sought my will and not your life, and therefore I will bless you forever. I will make you mighty in word and deed. Everything you want will be done according to your word, because I know you won't ask for anything that I wouldn't ask for. And then he also says in verse seven, behold, I give unto you power, that whatsoever you shall seal on earth shall be sealed on heaven in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And thus shall you have power among this people. This is a very key component of the second anointing of having your calling, calling election made sure. And according to Tom Phillips, who is uh, one of the only people who's actually gone public about his experience receiving the second anointing, that is indeed one of the powers that they are blessed with by an apostle, which is they're given that power to seal on earth and have it sealed in heaven. Yeah. Um, the the next little, do you have anything else you want to add in terms of the timeline of how all this gets, the theology gets kind of unveiled? I can do that really quick. And um, uh, yeah, so there's Tom Phillips. I'm going to skip him for a second. Um, let me see here. Can I uh, go here? Yeah, we had the Book of Mormon. There we go. I have it twice here in my outline. Sorry about that. Uh, the Holy Spirit of Promise, which is a synonym, gets mentioned in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 76, verses 51 through 53. That's 1832, so still pretty early on, but three years after the Book of Mormon was dictated. And here, the Holy Spirit of Promise, which ends up becoming a synonym for this kind of thing, uh, is described as that those who overcome by faith and are sealed by the Holy Spirit of Promise, which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. So once again, it sounds like there doesn't have to be an intermediary or an ordinance or a ritual to have this happen, but the Father sheds it forth upon those who are just and true. That's 1832, Doctrine and Covenants, section 76. By the way, the Holy Spirit of promise is not a mystery. It used to be a mystery to me because I didn't know what the heck it meant. And to hear Bruce R. McConkie describe it, it was very confusing. But very simply, the Holy Spirit of promise is the Holy Ghost. What is the promise that the Holy Spirit is making? The promise is that you're going to be exalted. That's why it's called the Holy Spirit of promise. Yeah. Now that makes sense. And I have yet to read any church authority actually describe it that way. Yep. So that was 1832. You talked about, um, oh, 1839. Now this is where he's still talking about it. Apparently not as a ritual. This is where he adds the idea about um, the second comforter. But before that, he says, if you're, if you're knocking yourself out, you get baptized, you repent, get the Holy Ghost, all that stuff. Knock yourself out being a good Mormon. Or in his words, let him continue to humble himself before God, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and living by every word of God. And the Lord will soon say unto him, son, thou shalt be exalted. So once again, even as late as 1839, Joseph Smith appears to be talking about this as something that has not been ritualized. All right. And then he says, um, then the man will find his calling and election made sure. Then it will be his privilege to receive the other comforter. OK, which the Lord hath promised the saints, as is recorded in the testimony of St. John 14 chapter. We talked about that before. So there is this connection that is made by Joseph Smith in 1839, that once you get your calling election made sure, that then you have the privilege of having the face to face with Jesus. And, and he described. I, go ahead. I think it's important to note that one has to have their calling and election made sure, aka second anointing, before one can receive the second comforter, aka Jesus showing up and telling you that you made it. And and so, how could you know you've made it through the second comforter? If, if the first thing to happen is you have your calling election made sure other than someone else delivers whatever that is to you and gives it to you and initiates you into something. And hence, anytime you see the phrase calling an election made sure, you can essentially place into that spot 
the phrase second anointing. Yes. Yes. Because second anointing is the only one of these expressions that I don't think is in any of the standard works. Yeah. And uh, you were talking earlier about how they made this so that now this all funnels through the the leadership of the church and it stops, you know, I mentioned uh, Denver Snuffer, but you mentioned like it stops other people from making claims. Um, it, it's kind of similar to that story with James Brewster, right? 11 year old who claims he sees Moroni and uh, can't have that. So he gets excommunicated. And from there on out, whether it's use of seer stones with, I think it's, is it Hiram Page? And uh, uh, James Brewster being 11 and claiming he's seeing Moroni. Uh, I think it was William Law or one of the Williams that was uh, trying to come up with his own revelations. And essentially, anytime someone tries to match the spiritual output that Joseph Smith is doing, the rules get changed and those men get eliminated quickly. And the church, I think, learned its lesson um, by ritualizing the second anointing so that people aren't claiming they're righteous enough that Jesus showed up in their room. Yeah, Brewster, wasn't that the name of the kid in Fright Night who lived next door to the vampire played by Michael Sarandon? I don't know that one, but I'm just <laughs> about 11 year old Brewster. Brewster. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, I'm sorry, just going on here because it's really important that I, I nail this down, at least Please. to me. Hopefully it is to the audience. Uh, Joseph Smith continuing on, same um, discourse. In 1839, he goes on. Now, what is this other comforter? It is no more or less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is the sum and substance of the whole matter, that when any man attains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him or appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the Father unto him. So apparently Jesus can show him the Father. Uh, and they will take up their abode with him. And the visions of the heavens will be open unto him. And the Lord will teach him face to face. And he may have and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Now I'm quoting different places from the same sermon. I'm not reading the whole thing, but I did want to mention something else, which is interesting. By the way, that's from the diary of Willard Richards. It's between June and July of 1839. They're not exactly sure what date, end of June, beginning of July, who cares at this point? It's 1839. Four years later now, Four years later, he gives a discourse in May, May 14th, 1843. And this is found in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 298. And now in Wilford Woodruff's diary, he records Joseph Smith as sort of changing gears. And now all of a sudden it starts sounding like it's more institutionalized. And in fact, it appears that maybe, maybe Joseph Smith started seeing a possible discrepancy in the idea of his 1838 account of the first vision or any account of the first vision, I'm speculating at this point because he does change his gears here. I mean, he's seen Jesus, right? He's seen Jesus. So does that mean he already had his calling election made sure when he was 14? That seems to be maybe problematic, not sure. But this is what he says. Um, Though they might hear the voice of God and know that Jesus was the son of God, this would be no evidence that their election and calling was made sure. So you see how he sort of backpedals on that? So now hearing the voice of God and knowing that Jesus was the son of God, that's not evidence that their calling and election was made sure. But then he goes on to say, then they would want that more sure word of prophecy that they were sealed in the heavens and had the promise of eternal life in the kingdom of God. Then having this promise sealed unto them, it was an anchor to the soul, sure and steadfast, Etc. So now he starts changing and saying, well, not having just Jesus appear to you or hearing this voice of God is enough. Something else is required. Now, if you get out your Doctrine and Covenants, section 131, this is from May of 1843. You referenced that before. This is where he gives this answer to what is the more sure word of prophecy. And he says the more sure word of prophecy means a man's knowing that he is sealed up unto eternal life. How? by revelation and the spirit of prophecy through the power of the holy priesthood. So here we definitely start seeing this idea that this has to be administered through another individual who who's, has the priesthood power to do it. Whose word of prophecy is more sure than the president of the church? It's the I don't most, have an answer to that. It's the most sure word of prophecy. Yes. And I and you know these are strange phrases. They obviously get marshaled into uh, usage here. And I'm not exactly sure. Does it mean that the prophet's word is sure, or that this means that now you are surely don't call me surely going to make it to the celestial kingdom? Not exactly sure, but it could be interpreted either way. 
But regardless, it is the person who has been appointed by the Lord to speak on behalf of his people, hence the prophet. Yes. And by the way, Bill, are you ready for me to go into a couple of verses in Doctrine and Covenants section 132? Uh it's funny you say that, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. What okay. verse would you like to go to? Well, there's three of them because once again, this ends up showing that now this has evolved to the point where it's a ritualized process. And the thing about section 132 is it really helps to know what they're talking about, to be able to understand what they're talking about. Because <laughs> it's not immediately apparent what they're talking about. And it's easy just to gloss over things. But when you know what they're talking about, all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, that's what they're talking about. Now, Doctrine and Covenants section 132, as we know, is about celestial marriage, which at the time that it was written and for many, many, many decades thereafter was synonymous with plural marriage. Celestial marriage was plural marriage until like the 1930s when um, J. Reuben Clark thought it would be a good idea to expand the definition of celestial marriage to include just eternal marriage with one wife, right? Yeah, it's, it's obviously clear in the 1886 revelation with John Taylor uh, that the new and everlasting covenant was polygamy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But this is how um, the calling and election made sure gets so uh, enmeshed with this whole idea of polygamy because it's talked about in here in association with polygamy. And then we've got a church who ends up getting rid of polygamy, but they still have this second anointing ritual. And so it continues to live on after the polygamy has gone away. So we have to understand that. And that helps make sense of it too. But these are these long and boring and legalistic verses, starting with verse seven. Do you have that? Yep. Let me go up there a little bit. Because the key passages are verses seven, 19 here and 26. Are. And here we go with verse seven. Please. All right. And verily I say unto you that the conditions of this law are these, all covenants, contracts, bonds, obligations, oaths, vows, performances, connections, associations, or expectations that are not made and entered into and sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed. There you go. Now, if you hang on just a second, go ahead and comment on that because now we're getting it full force, right? Yeah. Of him who is anointed. It is an ordinance that has to be performed by somebody who is anointed to perform the ordinance. I wonder who this could be. Yes. Well, I think we get a hint later on. Okay. Of him who is anointed both as well for time and for all eternity, and that too most holy by revelation and commandment through the medium of mine anointed, whom I have appointed on earth to hold this power, and I have appointed unto my servant Joseph to hold this power in the last days. And there is never but one on the earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of this priesthood are conferred, are of no efficacy, virtue, or force in and after the resurrection from the dead for all contracts that are not made unto this end have an end when men are dead. Okay, thank you. So the whole deal here is that it's easy. I mean, even my eyes start rolling back in my head at the beginning of that, where they start listing off all the different expectations and contracts and vows and oaths and obligations, right? So it's easy to... Uh, zone out and not catch the fact that now, now this has been ritualized to the point where it is an ordinance of some sort, though it's not described, that has to be performed by Joseph Smith, at least when he was on the earth. So now the power to do this has been, um, I, arrogated is probably the wrong word, but Joseph Smith has seen fit or God has seen fit to put this power in Joseph Smith's hand so that he can perform it as an ordinance rather than leaving it willy nilly and God speaking to people out in the woods by themselves. Right. Yeah. You, you've got to have order. And Joseph Smith is at the head of this and he, whether he's the voice or whether God's the voice, it is clear that we're not going to allow multiple people to be doing and being in charge of this. This is one man at the top. Right. So it goes on in verse 19 and 19 is really the passage. One of the passages in section 132 that gets quoted the most often, but we find the same kind of thing here together with some additional detail and actually, a number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago, when I was reading this and trying to understand what the heck they're talking about, it occurred to me that it does seem like this is an ordinance. This is before Tom Phillips came out with his great um, podcast over on Mormon stories a number of years back and actually talked about it. But it did strike me at the time that this is talking about 
not just getting married. This is talking about getting your calling election made sure in the form of an ordinance performed by another individual with the priesthood power and the keys. And it may even contain a quotation of what is said by the person who is performing that ordinance. Okay, say that again, that last little part. And it may even contain a quotation of some of the words that are spoken oh. by the person performing the ordinance. Yeah, some of the second anointing language is in here. I think so. It seems uh, it seems pretty clear to me. Uh, can you read that? Sure. And again, verily I say unto you, if a man marry a wife by my word, which is my law and by the new and everlasting covenant, and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed unto whom I have appointed this power in the keys of this priesthood, and it shall be said unto them, ye shall come forth in the first resurrection. And if it be after the first resurrection, and in the next resurrection. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. And shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and powers, dominions, all heights and depths. Then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life that he shall commit no murder, whereby to shed innocent blood. And if he abide in my covenant and commit no murder, whereby to shed innocent blood, it shall be done unto them in all things whatsoever my servant hath put upon them in time and through all eternity, and shall be of full force when they are out of the world, and they shall pass by angels and the gods which are set there to their exaltation in glory and all things as hath been sealed upon their heads, which glory shall be a fullness and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. Okay, so once again, you can see the different references to this being an ordinance that has to be performed by somebody else. I think that uh, it's obviously a quotation when it says, and it shall be said unto them. I mean, you've got a line there. You may as well have quotation marks, right? Right. That right. language, you shall come forth in the first resurrection. And if it be after the first resurrection and the next resurrection and et cetera, et cetera. And then there's also this other interesting part here. And it shall be written in the Lamb's book of life. Then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life. That hmm. he shall commit no murder whereby to shed innocent blood. Now, this is one of those things, and I apologize for this, because I've studied Mormonism to such an extent that um, I've learned quite a bit. I've also forgotten a lot of things, and this is one of the things that I partially learned and partly forgotten. I forgot where I got this from. So if anybody knows, please make a comment. If I have it wrong, please yeah. let me know that as well. But it is my understanding that all those who received the second anointing have their names written in a book that is kept by the church, probably in Salt Lake City. And that is called the Book of Life, probably called the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah, the Lamb's Book of Life. Isn't because that it, cool? You create yeah. a self-fulfilling prophecy. You, there's a scripture that says it's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You take a book, you title it the Lamb's Book of Life, you put people's names in it, and you nailed it. Right. And so you got the Lamb's Book of Life. And this is actually going to segue right in. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but in section 128, we're talking about baptism for the dead. Um, Joseph Smith says, this is a letter he wrote when he was in hiding from the law, I believe. But verse six and further, I want you to remember, oh, do you have that? Section 128, verse six. I'll start um, reading and see if you can find it. Because the yeah, first yeah, thing he does, ahead. I'll pull it up real quick. Yeah, the first thing he does is he references the Lamb's Book of Life in the book of Revelation. That is Revelation singular, by the way, not Revelations. And further, I learned that when I was reading a Stephen King book back in the 1980s. So I'm not actually going to tell you what happens and why it is it sticks in my memory because this is a public broadcast. But those of you who know the book Rage, which was one of his Bachman books, will know what I'm talking about. Anyway, singular. And further, I want you to remember that John the Revelator was contemplating this very subject in relation to the dead when he declared, as you will find recorded in Revelation 20, 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And, a, and another book was opened. Oh, there it is. And another book was opened, uh, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, seven, you will discover in this quotation that the books were opened and another book was opened, which was the book of life, but the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Consequently, the books spoken of must be the books which contained the record of their works and refer to the records which are kept on the earth. Mm. And the book, which was the book of life, is the record which is kept in heaven. 
the principle agreeing precisely with the doctrine which is commanded you in the revelation contained in the letter which I wrote to you previous, that will be section 127, to my leaving my place that in all your recordings it may be recorded in heaven because there's supposed to be earthly records kept, earthly books kept that correspond to the heavenly books and the heavenly records. And so there is an earthly book of life. And it's my understanding that in that book of life are recorded the names of those who have received the second anointing, who have had their calling election made sure. Because, I mean, of course, the church is going to keep track of this, right? They keep track of everything. Yeah, that's a no brainer. Obviously, they're going to write it down somewhere. And I believe that this is what it is called. By the way, you just when you got done reading uh, verse, I think it was 19 out of section 132, mm -hmm. there are lots of people who have heard these rumblings that when you receive the second anointing outside of shedding blood and murder and denying the Holy Ghost, which would also involve denying Christ, because if you deny Christ and you're denying the Holy Ghost anyway, um, without doing those things, you can do anything. As we talked about in the past episodes where we uh, tackled the credibility and integrity of the top 15 men, it was this recognition that once they've received the second anointing, it doesn't matter if they do shady business deals. It doesn't matter if, if they sexually assault somebody. It doesn't matter what kinds of things they do because section 132 verse 19 says, once they've had the second anointing, barring them killing somebody or denying the Holy Ghost, they made it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, and can, and can I just point out that there is a reference there, as long as they remain in the covenant, which could be interpreted to mean more than that. But if you go down to verse 26, it makes it really clear beyond dispute. That's the key verse as regards this. Um, Verily, you want me to read it? Uh, yeah, please do. Okay. Verily, I can, I can stop if you don't want me to. No, you're doing great. Actually, I was just scanning down to make sure I had the right verse. I thought yeah. I did, and I do. It's just in the second half. Go Perfect. Ahead. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man marry a wife according to my word, and they are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, according to my appointment, a.k.a. Joseph Smith, and he or she shall commit any sin or transgression of the new and everlasting covenant, whatever, and all manner of blasphemies, and if they commit no murder wherein they shed innocent blood, yet they shall come forth in the first resurrection and enter into their exaltation, but they shall be destroyed in the flesh and shall be delivered unto the buffetings of Satan unto the day of redemption, saith the Lord. So there still is, if you're, if you don't behave, there still might be a little bit of time spent hanging out with Lucifer and, and, and feeling a little uncomfortable, but eventually you're coming forth in the first resurrection and your exaltation is guaranteed. Absolutely. And so, and that's the whole point of it. And I will say that uh, a whole lot of speculation has ensued over the years amongst various church leaders, et cetera, about what does it mean to be, um, to shed innocent blood? What does it mean to deny the Holy Ghost? What whatever, does it, yeah, whatever, what do the buffetings of Satan mean? Yeah, whatever shedding innocent blood is, it's not what the Danites were doing. <laughs> right? Brigham did uh, seem to have a tolerance for a certain amount of violence uh, when when he took the saints out to Utah, and and even when he was leaving Nauvoo, and uh, the whistling whittlers, right? Those young mm -hmm. little ironic priesthood Boy Scouts who were just holding their little tiny pocket knives, and so uh, it seems as though there is a tolerance for violence. And Brigham Young has lots of quotes that seem to encourage violence, and I think he would clearly distinguish shedding innocent blood from shedding guilty blood. Yeah, and on a perhaps a less um, serious scale. Um, Elder Ballard is a good example because my take on the leaders of the church is they really try and bend over backwards to not lie. They prevaricate all over the place, right? And what they will try and do is equivocate and try and give an impression that they mean one thing when actually they mean something else. But they try not to lie. And yet here we have Elder Ballard, who's received the second anointing, who knows it's secret, who knows that nobody's supposed to talk about it, who knows that they hide it, going public and saying uh, that we've never hidden anything from anybody when he knows perfectly well that even right then he's hiding the fact of the second anointing. And you wonder what goes through their head. I'm not a mind reader. I can't tell. But is it possible that this is excused on the basis of the fact that, you know, I received my second anointing? They're under heavenly covenant to not 
to withhold that information and to obfuscate and deflect whenever they're asked. So they almost assuredly would see their covenant to God in the church as having precedence and priority over the commandment to be honest, just as uh, Nephi felt the commandment to slay Laban and cut off his head justified his breaking of the commandment of thou shalt not murder. Mm, good point. Good point. Yeah. So I had a bunch of Elder McConkey, Bruce or McConkey uh, quotes, and I'm not sure if we need to go into them. He certainly understood it and talked about it. And received I, it. Oh, definitely he received it. One of the things I wanted to bring up, though, because um, his hymn, his song that he wrote, you know what that one is? I believe in Christ. He is my king. I was okay. a chorister for a while. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> oh, who was it? Who um, Orson Scott Card wrote this little book back before he became a really famous science fiction author. Uh, it's called Mormon Speak. And I think uh, in it, he talked about the, the ward chorister. The chorister in the church is the, is the person without whom nobody will sing, but nobody looks at when they're singing anyway. Mm, okay, right. a little chorister humor for those of you out here with the calling. Anyway, in that uh, song, he refers to the second anointing, but he doesn't refer to it the way the ordinance is performed, in which he had obviously received. He goes back to Joseph Smith's initial teachings regarding it, like the voice you hear while you're out uh, working and doing the Lord's work. And that's in verse four. And that's where it says, if you follow along in the church hymn book, I believe in Christ, he stands supreme. From him, I'll gain my fondest dream. And while I strive through grief and pain, his voice is heard, he shall obtain. I tried to do it on cue with you, but I effed it up, so. You're fine, uh, ye shall obtain. This is his, I mean, this is like an Easter egg, right? In the hymn that he put in there to refer to getting your calling election made sure, at least the old way that Joseph Smith talked about it. He puts it in there. And I would guess that probably a lot of Mormons who have sung that had no idea that that's talking about getting your calling election made sure. Yeah, good old Bruce R. McConkie. I know with every beat of my heart <laughs> and I, right? That's that monotone kind of dry, slow it down a little bit, speed it up a little bit, but kind of stay the same. Oh, gosh. He was absolutely fantastic. You know, the thing I really liked about Bruce R. McConkie, is it okay to say something nice about Elder Bruce R. McConkie? Please. There's got to be plenty of nice things to say about him. God when he people. when he gave a talk, he actually had something to say. And he would tell you what it was that he was saying. First off, he would tell you what he was going to say. Then he would say it, and then he would tell you what it was he said. That's which a man is, with his convictions. Yeah, and it's also a, that's a, supposed to be what lawyers do in closing argument, mm. right? Because you can't just tell somebody something, expect them to remember it. You got to tell them three times. You tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what it was you told them, and then hopefully people will remember. And I would guess that he has more remembered talks than pretty much any other general authority in the LDS Church's history, yeah. for good or ill. Yeah. Um, he definitely was a man who thought he had the answers to all the questions. And I'll be honest, it was a much more fun time in Mormonism when there was so much more certitude of so many other things than, than kind of the fluff that they've uh, boiled it down to today. That was the time when scriptorians bestrode the church like a colossus. Yeah. Can I bring up one other thing? Because this is a great quote. It's rarely uh, talked about. And we're already on an hour, too, by the way. <laughs> oh, shoot. we got to talk about what actually happens when you get your calling election made sure. We'll just go for a little bit. It's okay. Okay. So anyway, this is Joseph Smith again. But this is from, what is it, uh, Willard Richards. This is May of 1842. So this is right around that time period. But he drops this wonderful hint. And this is what he says. Because we talk about knowing God, right? And there's a passage in John about no man... Uh, this is uh, eternal life to know God, the Father and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, which gets a lot of play in the temple endowment. Anyway, anyway, uh, this is what he was recorded as saying. No one can truly say he knows God until he has handled something. And this can only be in the holiest of holies. 
until he has handled something, and this can only be in the Holy of Holies. What is he talking about, RFM? Well, he leaves it up to people to surmise, to guess. He doesn't say what it is. But when I read this, and I, I thought that what he was referring to was talking about prints of nails and hands and feet. Mm. But he doesn't say it. But obviously, it's important because he says, you can't truly say you know God until you've handled something. Yeah, it's probably more serious than a coffin cane or something, right? Right. And it's probably not your little factory. <laughs> probably not your, uh, not your little factory. Oh, boy, those factories. But there's a, once again, there's this idea of this uh, appearance, sort of, of Jesus. And at least the way I understand it to be what he's talking about. And it's now linked to the temple. It's now linked to the Holy of Holies. And it's now linked to knowing God. So this is how these things get all wrapped together uh, with the calling election made sure, the second comforter, the appearance of Jesus, and the temple, and the Holy of Holies. Yeah. Yeah, all this stuff goes into it. Um, a couple little things here I wanted to point out before we talk about the actual ordinance. What did yeah. it accomplish in the early history of the church, and what does it accomplish today? Uh, I want to note that Brigham Young was the only person in the succession crisis vying for leadership who had received the second anointing. Um, and by the way, Sidney Rigdon was aware of that uh, because Rigdon immediately started going out and giving people second anointings, even though he had not gotten it himself. And it's one of the reasons listed for why he was excommunicated from the church, from the Brigham Young faction of Mormonism. Um, certainly Brigham saw the second anointing as adding credibility to his um, potential of taking leadership inside the church. Uh, number two, it creates an inner circle of people who can nod, nod, wink, wink, know among each other that they are the super cool, super elite Mormons. It allows one to think that they are better than those who haven't and to feel that their leaders trust them more than they do with other faithful members of the church. As Bruce M. McConkie pointed out on the front end of that, um, this is the very elect, a, a very inner circle among the faithful Mormons. And number three, as we just talked about, it creates a loophole that allows immoral and unethical choices and behaviors while having the get out of jail free card. Any thoughts on those three? Yeah, it certainly, certainly uh, has that unfortunate potential side effect. The yeah. last thing you said. And you can imagine that this is the pool from which uh, the top 15 pick new leaders to enter into the Quorum of the Twelve. Um, Tom Phillips mentions that it was, uh, I think, was it Elder Rasban that gets his second anointing at the same time uh, that he does? I'm trying to. I'm just trying. I'm just racking my brain trying to make sure whether it was Tom Phillips or Hans Matson. I think it'd it be Hans Matson. I think was it. Okay. Tom Phillips didn't mention Elder Rasband. Gotcha. Where Elder so Hans Matson mentions that uh, Elder Rasband got his second anointing at the same time that Matson did, and uh, again before these people enter the Quorum of the Twelve, the pool that are being selected from. You and I used to have an idea that if I could just be good enough, someday I might be able to be in the Quorum of the Twelve. Mm -hmm. Sorry, ladies, and. Um, uh, but the reality is that you really have to prove your loyalty over a long period of time, get the second anointing, and then maybe if you're just one of the very, very, very elect, a super secret inner circle among the faithful Mormons, then you get to serve in the higher echelons of the church. Yeah, one of the problems they were having with the second anointing early on was that it was almost like it was an appendage to the endowment. So you've got your first anointing. We call them washings and anointings, the initiatory ordinances. Then you have the endowment. And then apparently either right at the end of it or shortly thereafter, because these were going on in the Nauvoo temple as well as endowment, second anointings were going on. Many, many people were receiving their second anointings. Um, what ended up happening is that it was felt by leaders of the church later on that people were not appreciating the second anointing enough because they got it too fast. And so therefore it got separated from the endowment and a proving period of, well, probably decades was inserted in between if you ever got it at all. Right. Right. Uh, just a note, we've raised about 500 bucks so far tonight. RFM. Holy Toledo. Thank yeah. you, everybody. Yeah, appreciate everybody who does it. it. It's fascinating to see behind the scenes, to watch 
There are folks who donate, you know, a few bucks a month. There's folks that donate 50 bucks a month or hundred bucks a month, but it's a large group. Most of our donations, RFM, that come into Mormon Discussion Incorporated are made up of people who are donating somewhere around a hundred bucks a year or less. That is the, the far and wide majority of, of the money that comes into Mormon Discussion. And uh, just deeply appreciative as you are for everybody who who puts a few bucks our way. So we're, excuse me, we're at about $500. Um, let's jump into the actual ritual itself. I really uh, want to. Can I read this one by Bruce or McConkie? I apologize. I know we're an hour in. You're good. But the thing is that when you know what these terms mean, then all of a sudden you can read something as dry as Mormon doctrine and it's going to explode with new meaning. That was my experience, at least. So you got page 425 of the second edition. Mormon doctrine, here's what he says. Now listen, if this doesn't uh, sound familiar to you when he talks about this. Holders of the Melchizedek priesthood have power to press forward in righteousness. I do a terrible Bruce R. McConkie. Living by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, magnifying their callings, going from grace to grace. Now listen. Until... Through the fullness of the ordinances of the temple, they receive the fullness of the priesthood and are ordained kings and priests. Those so attaining shall have exaltation, shall have, by the way, exaltation, and be kings, priests, rulers, and lords in their respective spheres in the eternal kingdoms of the great king who is God our Father. Now, did that leap off the page to you that time? That does seem to be talking about, again, that secret code language. There's just that extra bit that gives you the fullness. That's why you have to have the decoder ring. And that is the second anointing. Yes. And the thing about it is, is that once you understand this, uh, all of a sudden you realize that the, the, the endowment itself, okay, when you're in the temple, the part that everybody can go through, as long as you have the temple recommend, right? You go through, you get your washings and anointings, and then you go to the endowment, and then there's this introduction to the endowment, and the voice comes over the speakers. And what you hear is that the second anointing is actually anticipated by the first anointing, because the washings and anointings that you receive as the initiatory ordinances in the temple are the first anointings. Okay, mm -hmm. it's these this this other uh, ordinance, this anointing that happens when you have your calling election made sure. That's why it's called the second anointing, and technically, it's a second washing and anointing, just like the first one is a washing and anointing. But when you go through the temple endowment in the introduction, the lecturer says, uh, "Brethren, you have been." I'm sure he says something else to the sisters. Brethren, you have been washed and pronounced clean, or that through your faithfulness you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. Mm. You have been anointed to become hereafter kings and priests unto the most high God to rule and reign in the house of Israel forever. Yes, he says, sisters, you have been washed and anointed to become queens and priestesses to your husbands. Then he says, pay attention, brethren and sisters, if you are true and faithful, the day will come when you will be chosen, called up on the phone from Salt Lake, called up and anointed kings and queens, priests and priestesses, whereas you are now anointed only to become such. So at the very beginning, beginning of the endowment, there is language here that anticipates the second anointing and making it clear Hey, the first anointing that you just received before this endowment started, that is just being anointed to become kings and queens, priests and priestesses. Your, All right, that's, your potential is announced. Yes. But the second anointing is when you are actually anointed not to become kings and queens, priests and priestesses, but you are anointed as kings and queens, priests and priestesses. Yeah. So you get the fullness, you get your exaltation assured, and uh, your calling and election is made sure. Yeah. And that's what that's how all these pieces fit together. So you wanted to get to the actual ordinance. Yeah. So let's just make a couple of notes. Um, from what we can tell based on Tom Phillips, 
Hans Matson and what little bits of data is out there. It appears that this usually happens on a Sunday because the temple's closed and that keeps all the other people away so that they don't see this going on. Um, uh, you have to be married. It's couples only. You don't, if you're a single male or single woman, you don't get to get the second anointing. Uh, unfortunately, you show up at the temple with. A, By the a, way, Bill, there may, there may be a few exceptions to that and even posthumous proxy, but that's changed over time. I remember in that paper, by the way, that great paper from Dialogue that was written by that fellow with the last name Berger, was it? Yeah. 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 He even talks about a time where, oh, this won't make sense now. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll save it for later if I get back to it. But there's two parts to this ordinance. Go ahead. Gotcha. Uh, normally happens on Sundays. A, a handful of couples come. So you would know the other couples that were getting the second anointing, but you you wouldn't know who else outside of that group has gotten it. And so uh, even you are limited in who you know and what you know about others who have received it. Um, I divided it. And, and actually, I think it's Wikipedia maybe that divided it. But there were three sections. There's the prayer and washing. Uh, first, the couple, uh, husband and wife, always together, which helps us understand its early practice coinciding with polygamy, and an officiator, which is normally an apostle or the president of the church, um, or, to, or to participate, an officiator or to participate in a prayer circle conducted by the husband in a dedicated temple room, and then the male officiator, an apostle or other acting under the direction of the prophet, remember the one being appointed, is the one under the sh more sure word of prophecy who has to initiate this ordinance taking place. Yeah, he has to rubber stamp the approval on it, the president of the church, for any of this right. to happen. And, and by the way, in Tom Phillips and uh, Hans Matson, there's the commentary that they recognize that the apostle that was there, which was Ballard, I think, in both cases, yes. said, I am here acting under the authority of the president of the church to give you this ordinance. So he's making it clear that this came from the more sure word of prophecy through the president of the church, the only one appointed who holds the keys to do this. Um, so they do this acting under the direction of the prophet washes only the husband's feet. So the uh, male officiator, Elder Ballard, in these two instances, washed the feet of the husband of, of each of these couples. Then there's the part called the anointing. Next, the officiator anoints the husband as king and priest to God and then anoints the wife as queen and priestess to her husband. For example, the following words were used by Heber C. Kimball during the second anointing of Brigham Young in the Nauvoo Temple in 1846. Brother Brigham Young, I pour this holy consecrated oil upon your head and anoint thee a king and a priest and the Most High God. By the way, if you don't get planets, what are you the king of? What are you the priest of? What are you, what are you ruling over? Rock and roll. If you don't get a planet, like we don't get planets anymore. Um, I pour this holy consecrated oil upon your head and anoint thee a king and a priest of the most high God over the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and unto all Israel. And I seal thee up unto eternal life that thou shalt come forth in the morning of the first resurrection and thou shalt attain unto the eternal Godhead and receive a fullness of joy and glory and power and that thou mayest do all things whatsoever is wisdom that thou should doest it, even if it be to create worlds and redeem them. And then the last part is the washing of the husband. It Originally, it says later at home in private, but as you and I both uh, recognized this week, listening to Tom Phillips, it now seems to happen in a separate room in the temple. But later at home in private, uh, the husband dedicates the house and the room. Then the wife symbolically prepares her husband for his death and resurrection as his priestess by washing and anointing the husband's feet and then laying her hands on his head to give a blessing. That was the old style of how this was done. Any insights from you on what they're doing today? Uh, n no, only what I hear, not what I've experienced. I want to make that absolutely clear for you anybody who has any question about that. You've not had your second anointing. Well, I didn't exactly say that. Here's the deal. <laughs> Here's the deal. We have been counseled not to share our most sacred experiences with yeah. the public. Yeah, okay? tell us more about that. Oh, I will here in just a second. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is how I divided it into two. There's a thing that happens with the apostle in, really, it's in the Holy of Holies. What did Joseph Smith say about the Holy of Holies? Well, anyway, it's in the Holy of Holies. Not every temple has a Holy of Holies that's constructed into it, and therefore a room that's dedicated for this purpose in the temple will do. 
So the first part is with the apostle, with the husband, the wife. There's the washing of the feet that the apostle does of the man. And then there's the anointing and the blessing and the, well, anointing him as a priest king. And then the wife as a priestess and queen unto her husband. And then the way I was looking at it is the second part then is done in a separate room in the temple now, uh, not going home. Apparently, there was a lot of time that passed sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, procrastination. Never, never what up? put off your second part of the second anointing until tomorrow when you can do it today. But a lot of people... A lot of people did, apparently, and that led to problems, right? Like when the husband dies in the interim. Right. Car and the wife comes back home. And, and the, wife comes back, yeah, the wife comes back to the, the leaders of the church says, uh, we've got a problem here. Uh, yeah. We never quite got around to the second part. Can we do this by proxy? Yeah. And I think they just said, yeah, that's okay. God will figure it out. But <laughs> uh, the rules change. Yeah. And so, but it goes into this other room. And then the wife... Uh, Right. Washes the feet again. And even so the man gets his feet washed twice, once by the apostle and the second part by the wife. And then she gets to put her hands on his head and give him whatever blessings she wants to. And apparently there's no direction on that. It's not like uh, giving somebody the Holy Ghost where you can pull out your little cheat sheet. Yeah, no, she gets to say whatever she wants. So, um, yeah, it, it, it is essentially a place where, as Elder Oaks gave a talk years ago, talking about how women have priesthood power, at least in this instance, the church seems to defer to the woman as having some sort of power or priesthood to operate with. She got something. It doesn't say that she uh, invokes or names the power or whatever, but there's two things that I want to say about this, okay? And I'll, I'll say them pretty quick because they're, they're positive things. I know that everybody thinks this is a big secret and it is a big secret and you probably shouldn't be having these secrets at the same time as telling people that you're not hiding anything from them. But nevertheless, nevertheless, it is interesting, number one, that in the second half of the most sacred ordinance that is done in this church, it's the woman who does it. Yeah. And even before that, when she washes her husband's feet, okay, now that's kind of demeaning, right? But it's also what the apostle just did. And the apostle did it because that's what Jesus did. Yeah. So the apostle is representing Jesus when he washes the feet. And the wife is in the same position. Now, it may be riffing on a different story. There's, of course, a story about Jesus washing the apostles' feet on the night before you know, the mm -hmm. crucifixion. But there's also this other story, which is of the, um, what is it? It's the oil. I think it's spike nard. In at least one of the accounts and it's all valuable and judas gets all wrapped around the axle when mary or this woman takes it and then breaks it over jesus and apparently there's oil all over him and she anoints his body and then washes it off with her her hair i think is a scriptural account which i'm sure sounds more romantic than it actually is in practice but uh judas then starts upbraiding the woman right and uh jesus says no back off Judas, because she knows what she's doing. She's actually anointing my body for my burial. And so that story is what's replicated in the second part of the, um, the second anointing where the woman stands in for Mary. And in fact, it is talked about in some sources as giving her a claim upon her husband in the resurrection. Yeah, this comes from the Journal of Heber C. Kimball, book 91, April 1st, 1844. Uh, I uh, First day, April 44, I, Heber C. Kimball, received the washing of my feet and was anointed by my wife, Violet, for my burial. That is my feet, head, stomach, even as Mary did Jesus, that she might have claim on him in the resurrection. Yes. Then Mary Ellen A. Kimball's journal, February 18th, 1857, um, Heber C. Kimball came to our room and said he did not feel well, spoke of an ordinance which he had previously taught and said that only one of his wives had attended to. He then spoke of our Savior and his wives, but more particularly of Mary and her faithfulness to the Lord, said Mary felt to say that she intended to devote her time to him, for he had told her that his time was short and he must soon leave them. This idea of washing and preparing the body for burial and resurrection 
which I'll bring up a little picture here. Um, this is a old tub from old time in early church history. And so you and I were talking that this maybe was the washing and anointings. This might have been the second anointing in this idea of washing somebody. Is that in a temple? It looks like a bathtub with a it stool is. next to it. That is a that is in the temple. Um, that's an old picture from the Salt Lake Temple in the ten, one of the ten washing and anointing rooms. Um, but it should be noted here that we've all heard these rumblings that Mary was Jesus's wife. Jesus was married. Maybe he was married to more than one woman because polygamy is an eternal principle. It needs to be understood that in the early documented history of the church, we have apostles and their wives talking about how the second anointing is designed to bind the wife as having claim upon her husband in the eternities, just like Mary as she washed the Savior's feet, would then have claim upon him in the resurrection. And so now we all know why deep in the shadows, deep in the closet of, of all these skeletons, the church has to acknowledge that maybe Jesus was married. And I think in private, they would say he absolutely was, because this is part of the theology behind the second anointing. Very, very interesting. And yes, the endowment itself, of course, uh, is an enactment of a ritualized variation of the creation account in Genesis and the fall of Adam and Eve, right? So in other words, there's a scriptural story that a ritual is being developed around and presented through. Well, with the first part of the second anointing, it's another scriptural story, but since from the New Testament about um, the first part about Jesus washing his apostles' feet, that's replicated. Then the second half of the second anointing is an enactment of the story in the New Testament about Mary washing, well, actually anointing Jesus for his burial. And you and I were talking about this this week. Again, we, I'm speculating. When you prepare a body for burial so that you might have, you might prepare it essentially to be resurrected in the resurrection and you're trying to preserve the body you're not just going to put some oil on the feet or some perfume on the head you are going to uh, go through whatever your culture's embalming process is and in uh, israel in in uh, the jewish faith we constantly get these stories of essentially having the entire body washed and the entire body uh, perfumed so as to essentially do your best to preserve that body so that it may come forth in the resurrection. It makes perfect sense then that perhaps some sort of tub or large basin would have been used so that you could essentially do that very thing. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I can't remember which gospel account it is in, but of course, on the morning of the resurrection, the women head out to where Jesus was put in the borrowed tomb and they take with them the spices and the ointments in order to prepare the body uh, which they didn't have the chance to do prior to that, mainly because of the Sabbath falling. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, I want to make one other note here. Uh, and then I, I guess whatever other, th let me ask you this. What other things do you want to say about the actual procedure itself? The other thing I wanted to say is that there is a certain balance and symmetry that is provided by this that is not available without it. So in other words, there's a lot of times people have, uh, problems with the idea that, uh, oh, the man is the one who knows the new name of his wife and the wife doesn't know the new name of her husband. So he has the power over her to bring her forth from the grave, right? To call her forth on the morning of the first resurrection and bring her forth. Well, on the other side of that, she also has a claim on him through her part in the second anointing. Mm. The other part is that one of the, the problems about Mormonism and I say this uh, with charity and love, I think, is that you're always supposed to be busy trying to work your way to the point where you're going to be saved slash exalted, but you never know if you've made it. There is no mechanism that you can know that you've made it. It's just sort of up in the air and it causes a great deal of anxiety and stress among true believing Mormons. Uh, if you look at um, uh, born again Christians, right? They've got the mechanism all already in place. I don't know if you've got the commercials down there, but they're on TV now about, uh, you know, do, can you, do you know if you're safe? Do you know if you're going to go to heaven? You can know, right? That's their big selling point because you have I to was, say. 
Yeah, I was saved on January 3rd, 1983, when I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart. Yeah, so they know exactly when you say the sinner's prayer, you accept Jesus into your heart, boom, you're saved, you know it. You are sealed up into eternal life. It's the functional equivalent of the second anointing. Now, that may have its own theological issues. I think pretty much any theological position is going to have its own problems. But at least with the second anointing, you have a time at which in this life, hopefully, you can have some peace on the issue and know that, yes, you have done enough. You can take a breath. You can't slack off completely, probably. But at least you have this end to the anxiety, this end to the question. And you can know that it has happened. Your day of judgment has been advanced, is how Bruce R. McConkie put it in one place. You don't have to wait for the day of judgment. It's been advanced. You've been found worthy. You've made it and everything is good to go. So I see those things as, as positives and they help round out the picture of the ordinance work in the temple and the theology of Mormonism. Uh, Tom Phillips and Hans Matson both tell us in, uh, Tom Phillips did an interview with John DeLynn on Mormon stories and Hans Matson wrote a book, uh, Truth Seeking. And both of them recount their second anointing experiences. Both of them say that they were counseled and told not to share that they were anointed secondly with anyone. And that if anybody asked, what was the response they were supposed to give RFM? Oh, well, here's the deal. That, that's the connection between the second anointing and seeing Jesus, the second comforter, which Tom Phillips totally understood, totally believed. I mean, like I did, I, I don't know if you did. I think most mm -hmm. TBMs who actually learn about this and read teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, they make that connection because he made it in that quote we gave from whatever, whatever year it was. It was 1843 or 1842. Anyway, no, it was 1839. Anyway, anyway, um, yeah, you get your calling and election made sure, and then you see Jesus. And so Tom Phillips goes through the process. It was in the Preston, England temple where Elder Ballard showed up to perform the ordinance, at least the first part of the ordinance. And he's waiting for Jesus to show up because he's expecting to see Jesus that day in the temple. And he doesn't see Jesus. He has a wonderful experience. He says he's like walking above the ground. He's so, so uh, happy. And would you time that in your most believing moment, when you were all in on the church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, if you had been, if a phone call had been placed to RFM's home and you had been invited with your wife to come in for your second anointing, wouldn't you have expected Jesus to show up in the room? If. <laughs> right. If. Yes. If that had right. happened. Yes, I would have expected that there. And now, yeah, of course I would have because that's how it's supposed to happen. And uh, Tom Phillips describes how uh, he didn't see Jesus that day in the temple and he didn't see him that night and he didn't see him the next day or the day after. And he starts wondering after a while, where the heck is Jesus? You know? Right. Um, and so it's like that old uh, song from the seventies, uh, you know, have you seen her? Tell me, have you seen her? Yeah. Anyway, it's better with the, um, the orchestration. So, but he's wondering, why haven't I seen Jesus? I mean, this is supposed to go along. It's like love and marriage. They go together like the second anointing and seeing Jesus. And so finally, it's been like maybe a year, year and a half, and he sees this general authority so he can ask him. And he has to be very careful about it because, you know, you're not supposed to talk about the second anointing outside the temple because nobody's supposed to know. But this other guy's received it. So he talks to him and he's like, um, when am I going to see Jesus? When is Jesus? <laughs> you know, when does Jesus show up in this whole thing? Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, I don't I don't know what happened with everybody else, but I, I haven't seen Jesus yet. Like when does he when does he come? Yeah, because <laughs> it's just like, oh man, it's so sad. It really is. It's like this kid has been waiting, uh, you know, behind the furniture, looking at the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve, waiting for Santa Claus to show up. And he does it. And by now it's like January, February, March, April. He's still waiting for him to show up. The tree's still there, no presents under it. No, he's <laughs> exactly. So he's talking to mom and dad. Hey, when does Santa show up? So right. this is what he's doing. He's talking to general authority. He says, when does Jesus show up? And I can't remember exactly. Uh, all the details are not spelled out with entire lucidity by um, Tom Phillips when he's telling the story. But this discussion occurs then where the general authority 
tells him, if anybody asks you if you've seen Jesus, here's how you respond. What you say is, we have been counseled not to share our most spiritual experiences in public. Wait a minute. I, I've heard that phrase or something similar to it used in other places. Yes, you have. Very much you have. And Tom Phillips is listening to him and he's going, well, wait a second. This guy knows I haven't seen Jesus yet because I just told him that. And now he's telling me that if somebody asks me if I've seen Jesus, who he knows and I haven't have. seen. And you what? have. Right, you, and you haven't seen him. Right. That I'm supposed to give this line to people to make them think that I have, but that it's just too sacred to talk about. So you haven't seen Jesus, but people want to know if you've seen Jesus and you're to tell them that you've had sacred experiences, which you're not allowed to share. Right. Huh. Where have we heard that kind of rhetoric before? Well, you hear it a lot, but the Boise Rescue was one where Elder Oaks really doubled down on this. And it's a wonderful place there because, you know, he's there trying to keep members in the church and to keep them from going after Denver Snuffer because they're leaving the church in Boise in droves to go after this Denver Snuffer fellow, right? And it's really hacking off church leadership because Denver Snuffer is out there claiming, yeah, I've seen him. I hang out with him every night. No, I'm kidding. Ken, Denver, I'm kidding. I know. But not every night. Yeah. But but there is that claim there, right? And so here's Denver Snuffer claiming to do things that Joseph Smith did that the leaders of the church don't do. I mean, they're just like managers, you know? They don't have any kind of spiritual uh, intuition, inspiration, experience. Prove me wrong. Anyway, so they, they go to Boise to try and staunch the flow and... Elder Oaks is talking about this idea about apostles being special witnesses of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the, the name of Jesus Christ. That changed. Right. We've changed that too. Absolutely. Now, you and I know, and we've read the correlated curriculum and the manuals that say over and over again that the, the apostles are special witnesses of Jesus Christ. And we know what that's supposed to mean because it's we've been taught it. Yeah. That they see Jesus, that they have had the second comforter. Because right. if they haven't seen Jesus, if they haven't heard his voice, then what makes them any more better or special than us? Well, nothing that I can see. You know, that's the whole point of it, right? I mean, you go back to Acts chapter 1, where they're picking the new apostle to take the place of, you know, that Judas left when he went and committed suicide. Well, he probably left the place open when he betrayed Jesus before he committed suicide, but they got to pick a new one, right? So right. the whole idea is, okay, who are we going to pick? And then they say, well, what, what we got to do is you got to pick somebody who's traveled with us and has seen Jesus and actually was present and watched him. And so he can be a witness of Jesus. He can be apostle of Jesus. And this is what they bank on. So they are, they're apostle, they're a special witness of Jesus Christ. And then Elder Oaks now all of a sudden wants to really quote the scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants really carefully. And very, very briefly, what he says is, no, we're not special witnesses of Jesus Christ, contravening all of this teaching, all of this, all these manuals, which are supervised and approved by church leadership. No, it's the name of Jesus Christ, because that's what it says in Doctrine and Covenants. And then he says, just because we're witnesses of the name of Jesus Christ doesn't mean that we've seen Jesus. On the other hand, he hastens to add, just because an apostle doesn't have to see Jesus to be an apostle doesn't mean that we haven't seen him either. Hmm. And then he says, but we have been counseled not to share our most sacred experiences in public. Huh. And that's the answer you give when you haven't seen Jesus, but you're asked if you have. Exactly. And by the way, chronologically speaking, Tom Phillips interview in which he said this, and what he was told by the general authority was broadcast on Mormon stories well before the Boise rescue. Okay. I was going to try to pull up here uh, Hans Matson's um, thing, which I sent you today. And let me see if I can pull this up here. Um, Maybe I should sing some more of that song. Have you seen her? I don't think I did a very good job with that. Anyway, 
So this is something also, of course, because of the nature of the ordinance. That's why it is generally performed with husband and wife, because you got to have the husband there and you got to have the wife there to perform, to perform the second part of the ordinance. And of course, this whole marriage thing is important because that has to happen too for you to be exalted, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. again, I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing it right away. I was hoping I could find it really quick, but essentially Hans says the same thing that I was told, you know, if somebody asks, I'm to avoid answering that question directly at all cost. And that I'm to tell people that the experience was too sacred to share that I've, I've had experiences that are too sacred and I'm not to share those and throw essentially pearls before swine. Yes. So you're supposed to hide it, keep it secret, keep it safe. And there is this ordinance that is very important, obviously, in the LDS church, which by design is not supposed to be known about by members of the church. Now, once again, this is different from the temple. We have circles within circles of secrecy, of holiness, of elitism, if you want to call it that, within the LDS church. Now, we've got temples. Everybody knows we've got temples. There are things that go on in the temples. We know about baptisms for the dead before we go to the temple. We know about this thing called the endowment before we go to the temple. We know about maybe even washings and anointings before we go to the temple. But we're not supposed to know everything about them. And they're so somewhat hazy until we go through the temple to experience them ourselves. And then we're really not supposed to talk a lot about it outside the temple, right? But we know about them by name. This is something even beyond that where we don't even know it exists and the plan is that we're not supposed to know it exists until and unless we've received it. And that's why it's done on Sundays when the temple is closed to the public. So nobody else is going to be there and see it happen. That's why when you are uh, given this invitation, what you do is you're instructed just to, you know, make up some kind of excuse because you're obviously not going to go to church. You're going to go to the temple. And if anybody asks where you're going, well, you know, say Arby's or something. You're not going to go to the temple to get your, your second anointing. You never say it before. You never say it after. And in fact, at the end of it, they talked about the charge given by Elder Ballard or whoever the apostle may be, may be, presumably. You don't talk about this to anybody. You don't let anybody know that you've received it. Yeah, here's Hans Matson's words. He says, one of Ballard's primary directives was that no one share that they received the second anointing. He said uninitiated members shouldn't even know the ordinance exists. Isn't that the same guy who said that we're not hiding anything? It's the exact same guy, isn't it? It's the same guy who said, knowing the church, knowing all of its leaders, we've never, ever hid anything. Let me see if I can play that again. This this idea that the church is hiding something, that, which we would have to say is, Two apostles who have covered the world and know the history of the church and know the integrity of the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve from the beginning of time. There has been no attempt on the part in any way of the church leaders trying to hide anything from anybody. Now, Elder Ballard was the officiator in both Hans Madsen and Tom Phillips. Both Hans Madsen and Tom Phillips said that Elder Ballard told them, this is what it says, he said, uninitiated members shouldn't even know the ordinance exists. If anyone asks, deny any knowledge whatsoever. In other words, you lie. He is telling them that lying for the Lord is perfectly okay. And we have absolute proof in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established that Elder Ballard on one hand says, don't lie. No, not lie. Don't, we're not hiding anything. And in the other instance, he's telling people receiving the second anointing, hide and lie at all costs. Deny it. Just deny it. <laughs> This to, you couldn't write you couldn't write a better script like real life here in Mormonism is way better than the movies. Absolutely, and in case there's any question, and I don't think there is, but to tie this one off with a bow, <laughs> yes, Elder Ballard performed the second anointing for Hans Monson, and he performed the uh, second anointing for Tom Phillips before he said that at the yes. face to face, which I think was in 2017, just four years ago. 
Yes, absolutely. So there you have it. There's that. Um, I want to add one little thing. I always remembered growing up knowing that the Jehovah's Witnesses put great importance on the 144,000. Um, I did not know this about Mormonism. This was, again, I'm always surprised since I've always been studying this stuff since I investigated uh, as a teenager. I've been reading Mormonism passionately, and I'm always surprised when in my later years now, I learned something new. Um, in two different accounts, there is mentioned History of the Church, Volume 6, 196, 4th of February, 1844, Discourse by Joseph Smith. Um, I attended prayer meeting with the Quorum of the Holy Order, in other words, those who have received their second anointing, in the assembly room and made some remarks respecting the 144,000 mentioned by John the Revelator, showing that the selection of persons to form that number had already commenced. Then, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 366, 2nd May, 1844, Discourse by Joseph Smith. I'm going on in my progress for eternal life. It is not only necessary that you should be baptized for your dead, but you will have to go through all the ordinances for them, the same as you have gone through to save yourselves. There will be 144,000 saviors on Mount Zion, and with them an innumerable host that no man can number. Oh, I beseech you to go forward and make your calling and election made sure. In other words, those who receive the second anointing are those who fall into the 144,000 and the rest of us non-elite inner circle of the faithful get to be those who follow behind. Yes. Very interesting, isn't it? It is all deep stuff when you take a long view, see the forest from the trees on the second anointing here on Mormonism Live. Yes. I'm glad you found that because I had never heard of that either. I certainly heard about it with the Jehovah's Witnesses, but not with the Mormons. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts here? The only thing I would I would say, maybe as we're starting to wrap up, people are asking who gets it. Um, the top 15, sure as hell, and probably long before they become in the top 15. But 70s, uh, uh, school presidents, right? Elder Bednar, Elder Holland, when they're, when they're presidents of the school. Uh, mission presidents almost assuredly get it. Uh, again, some of this is speculation, but I'm, I'm going off of what my, my data tells me. Temple presidents and presidencies for sure. How about the top people at the SCMC? What do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely, because they're general authorities. Yeah. yeah, the whole idea is that pretty much anybody who's in the first or second quorum of the 70, and this is per Tom Phillips, and any other general authority apostles, et cetera, and lots of other people, by the way. It's not just general authorities who have received this. In fact, I think until relatively recently, this may have changed, uh, but what would happen is that when your stake president changed, Think back uh, your time in the church when you had a change in your stake presidency. It happens about every 10 years. You get a new stake president and an apostle. An apostle has to show up in order to do that. So it's a big deal. And what would happen is, of course, there's these other meetings that happen outside the, the church worship services where the apostles meeting with missionaries, meeting with stake president, meeting with this, meeting with that. But one of those meetings that was commonly held was a meeting with the apostle and the stake president, usually the outgoing stake president, and the apostle would ask the stake president, okay, do you have any people in your stake that you feel would qualify for the second anointing? Now, at that point, it presumes that the stake president has received it. Because this is the problem with it, right? If you're going to keep it secret, you can only really be talking about it with people who have already received it themselves. You can't talk about it with somebody who hasn't received it, right? And I think that it may have gone away from that. And maybe not all stake presidents have their second anointing now. But this was the practice. So, uh, and then they would recommend some people, it's generally a couple, right? Probably advanced in age, not your younger set. They prove themselves. And so then it goes up for a, um, an approval by the president of the church. And then an invitation is extended and that's how it happens. So mm -hmm. actually within the church and maybe within your ward or stake, if you're still going to church, or if you're thinking back to when you used to, there were probably people in your congregation, in your stake, who may have received their second anointing and you would never know it because they never told you about it because and, yeah, they were they, told not to. 
Yeah, and they would deny it if you asked them. Um, what do you think? John D. Lee received the second anointing? Uh, probably, sure. The Danites? That that I'm not sure about. May, if you're talking about the Danites in Utah, I don't know. If you're talking about uh, Missouri, I think that in Missouri it may not have been advanced Correct. to the point of being a ritual at that point. What about so the I'm top sure. lawyers at Curtin and McConkie? All lawyers who are Mormon have received it. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> have at you? Least, that's what I heard. Let me ask again. Have you received this <laughs> good morning? Look, Bill, I don't know how many times I have to tell you this, but I we have been instructed not to share our most sacred experiences in public. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, what compelled, let me ask you this, what compelled Joseph Smith to create a temple priesthood ordinance granting absolution from all sins, past, present, and future for anyone who received it? What are your thoughts on that? Like it, it really does cover some. Well, it does. And I know that there's a tendency of people to go to the nefarious side of things. And certainly there may be room for that. I would also say that one of the things that Joseph Smith is, is grappling with theologically is the issue of predestination, which was very prevalent at the time among other churches, especially Calvinist churches, this idea of predestination and it's sealed, it's done. And uh, he didn't go along with that. And of course, we talk in our church, we try to make a distinction between foreordination and predestination. And everybody who's listening knows what I'm talking about. But it may be that Joseph Smith used this as a way to come up with a system that incorporates that idea without making it you know, universal to humanity the way that Calvinists do. That if you're predestined for hell, you're going to go to hell no matter what you do. And if you're predestined to heaven, then you're going to go to heaven no matter what you do. Yeah. Have you ever seen one of these? I have, but only because of you. Yeah. So I have a, a friend who sent this to me. He was at the house where this was at and it was the parents. Um, his friend was the son of this family that they're at their home. And the son's like, Hey, let me tell you something. I'm just telling you, you can believe me or not, but my parents got the second anointing. I, I just know. And I don't know if they told, I don't know how he figured it out, but he, he goes, they have this on their mantle. This, they have this, this is the exact picture and basin they have on their mantle. He goes, I went with my parents over to their good friend's house. Who's another prominent member in the stake. And he's got the same picture and the same bowl on their mantle. And so I don't know if they get this to take home with them. I don't know if it's used as a signal to each other. If you're in someone's home and you see this. I don't know what the story is. Maybe Tom Phillips or Hans Matson can jump in and and tell us uh, um, whether they've seen something like this. I'll shoot this image over to Hans tonight after we get done. But I'm far as I know, this picture and this bowl, it looks like something that would be used to pour water over someone's feet, right? Absolutely. And, it's for washing your feet. Yeah. I just and want so, to know who makes these. Who's got the contract to make these for the church? By the way, I do have that information, but I don't have it handy. My friend being the smart guy that he is, took pictures of the bottom of the bowl and the bottom of the pitcher. Does it say ponderize? I don't, it doesn't, but I don't no. have it. But on the bottom, it does tell you who the manufacturer is. Really? Yes. Okay. So I might be able to locate the very company that supplies the basins and pitchers for second anointings. You and I could order a pair. You could wash my feet. I could wash yours. We could promise each other not to talk about it. And then we'd be second anointed. That would be awesome. Because Except for the prophet, he wouldn't be involved. Right. Well, anyway, that's too bad because then it doesn't work. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can't, it can't be a big money maker, right? Because they can't sell too many of those, but maybe they just really up the price in order to make up the difference. <laughs> right. And they're ordering tons of these, right? They're getting them in quantity. Look what Logan says. Yeah, I know. Look at that. On the bottom of the picture. We have been trying to reach you regarding your car's extended warranty. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, man. What do you think of Elder Ballard lying, blatantly lying? What do you think of that? He was probably thinking of something else. He was actually he was actually talking about church history when he was making that statement. So um, he didn't mean to be lying about the second anointing when he was busy lying about church history even though he's already promised that if he is asked about the second anointing, he's going to lie about it. Yes. Yes. Good. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. 
Um, any other thoughts here as we wrap up? I put the number at the bottom of the screen. Any other things here you want to cover before we take phone calls? I think we have covered this pretty darn well, given the fact we've only been going at it an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, I thought we moved fast and furious. I thought we both kind of helped each other stay on task. I think we covered all the ground that we've got written down. If anybody wants to know more about the second anointing, my two cents would be go into the episode notes here on YouTube. If you click uh, the synopsis where it says like read more and then click that and it'll drop down, you'll see that I've got all the resources in there. Um, By the way, RFM, I'm going to tell you something. We were at like 7,100 when we started the night tonight. We are at 8,775. Wow. Uh, 1600 bucks or so. Can I just tell you something? Yeah. Honestly, I, I'm humbled by that. I know I say a lot of stuff, but this is really me. I am humbled by that. Thank you very, very, very much, everybody, for doing that. And what's the problem with getting to how much were we looking for? We were looking for $1,000 and uh, we've raised a little over 1600 Holy cr- Oh, more than you were at- yeah, sixteen hundred dollars, my friend. Okay, I'm really, really humbled. And, Thank and I you. Want to say, you, Pete, you know this. I mean, RFM's told you guys this before. The time it takes during the course of a week to put all this together, it is hours and hours that you're spending. I'm spending. Uh, I think sometimes in your episodes, you're spending more than me. You're very, very thorough. You're writing tons of pages of notes, people. It it means a lot to us that you see value in what we're doing and what we're sharing. And it means the world to us that uh, tonight we brought in over 1600 bucks. That is pretty dang awesome. Um, I do have a caller on the phone, RFM. Are you ready for phone calls? Absolutely. Are we going to announce the phone number? Yeah, the number is 435-200-3478 or 435-200-FIST. Who's on the phone with us tonight? Hi, I'm Amy. Amy, you are on live, Mormonism Live, with RFM and Bill Real. Um, Have you gotten your second anointing? Definitely not. Definitely not. Tell us what your thoughts are on tonight's episode. Well, thank you for asking if I've had my second anointing because I'm literally trying to figure out, please, someone explain it to me like I'm five. Maybe I'm just too dense to understand these deep principles. But what is the benefit of the woman being sealed to the man if he's already sealed? They're already sealed. Is there a special just wink, wink? Like really, truly, what's the benefit to her? I don't understand it. That's a great question of which I don't know. RFM, any thoughts from you? Well, this is the confusion that naturally ensues, Amy, from, and I don't even know if she can hear me, but uh, anyway, we have a technological problem. The thing is this, sealed means different things. They are sealed together. See, we use that word. It creates confusion. We should say married, okay, because they're married together but they haven't been sealed up to eternal life. That's the sealing that is being referred to when you have your second anointing. You're not being sealed together again. Both of you are being sealed up to eternal life. And that is the original and pervasive meaning of the word seal. And it gets confusing when the same word gets applied to different things. Does the, I... Yeah, could you hear me? Could you yeah, hear me, yeah. Bill? She could not, but I told her that she wouldn't be able to and that she'd have to check out your answer after the fact on the show. No, Sorry, Amy. We've got our, our second call coming in. Uh, caller, you're on live with Mormonism Live. What's your name? Uh, my name's David. David. David, have you received the second? By the way, our family, it doesn't matter if we ask. I can't trust his answer. If he has or hasn't received the second anointing, he's going to tell me he hasn't received it. Right. And if he tells me he has received it, we know he hasn't received it. I'm sorry, what? If he tells you that he has received it, we know he hasn't. This is like one of those logic problems that I was always tell- terrible at. If in school. you're under covenant with Jesus Christ and the prophet of the church to not disclose you've been second anointed, then I can trust that anybody telling me they've been second anointed hasn't been second anointed. But the people who tell me they haven't been second anointed might be telling the truth that they haven't, and they might be lying because they have to, and they actually have. Did you say your name was David? By the way, Bill, this is why. David. This, this is. I'm David. sorry. This is why I have never told you that I have received my second anointing. Right, you couldn't. You couldn't tell me. I would know you're lying. It's like it's like a handshake with a spirit. Um, David, have you received your second anointing? No, sir. Mm. Could be. It could be David. I don't know. I, I wasn't really convinced by that answer. I think David needs to sell it more. Yeah, David, what, what's on your mind tonight about having one's calling and election 
made sure by the more sure word of prophecy? Well, Bill, um, I think uh, you guys have imported the concept of second anointing into section 132. When you read verse 26, I'm not really sure how you guys came to the conclusion that a calling and election is made sure to get that promise. The way I read that verse is that any person that has been sealed in the temple, because that's all it's speaking about if you read the language, that this verse allows God to test that person. In other words, they can go through a divorce, they can have their life wiped out, destroyed, and they will still be exalted. And it has nothing to do with the second anointing. I know the brethren want to proclaim that it does, but the scripture in section 132, verse 26, does not say that. It says if you've been sealed, and that includes you, Bill Real, it doesn't matter that you've been excommunicated. It doesn't matter. As long as you don't shed innocent blood, or deny the Holy Ghost, you will come forth in the um, morning of the first resurrection. You will be exalted because you've had the everlasting covenant. You've entered into temple marriage. And that's how I read it. I'll take my answer offline. I'd like to know what you guys think. Thank you. Um, just to uh, let, give me a moment and put this other person here. Uh, just hold for a moment, okay? No, just if you'll be kind of silent for a second. Sorry, I'm doing this right on the live uh, show, but we're going to answer the previous caller's question first, okay? Okay, no problem. All right, all right. Um, so section 132 says that these things have to happen under the appointment of him who has been appointed, the prophet. And when you go to be sealed in the temple for time and all eternity to your beautiful bride, do you need first presidency approval for that? I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm asking you, RFM. Oh, oh no, no, no. I think I think the problem here is is not reading 26 in conjunction with verse 19. And that's where it's really clear that it has to be performed by somebody else, that it appears to be a separate ordinance in addition to uh, marriage. And I think the and is very important in that. But it's certainly not uh, something that's pellucid and has led to all sorts of uh, different interpretations. And the one that David suggests is one that has been common for quite a while. In fact, if you remember Bruce R. McConkie's talk from 40 years ago, the seven deadly heresies, I believe this was heresy number three that he addressed. Now, just because he calls it a heresy, I'm not saying that that really means anything except he didn't believe it and he wanted to put it down or he even may have believed it and still wanted to put it down publicly. Right. But that was a that was what he considered a heresy that once you're marrying the temple, that's it. And I think that he's right. And I think that although that's a straightforward understanding of verse 26, I think when you throw verse seven and 19, I think it was seven. Yeah. Seven and 19 into it then you'll start seeing that this is talking about something in addition to the marriage. And once again, this gets to the point where back when this was happening in Nauvoo, that plural marriage, which is not eternal marriage, it's plural marriage. Celestial marriage is plural marriage. That plural marriage is so closely linked with getting the second anointing, which is why you have the quorum of the anointed, right? That's the quorum of those who have received the second anointing, which by definition are those who have been married in the temple and usually polygamously right in the temple or at least in joseph smith's uh red brick store on the second floor before the temple was completed um that's my answer to that and hopefully that was clear enough i mean it's certainly a discussion that can be had but i think that that's why not i think that but that's why i went over verse 19 and verse 7 in order to try and give the context for verse uh 26. But yeah. yeah, different people can read it and come up with different results. But I think that, at least for me, understanding the history and the code language of second anointings, including fullness of the priesthood, et cetera, when I read this all of a sudden, now I start seeing more in it. And I think I understand it better than I would if I were not bringing that knowledge to my understanding and reading of this text. And, and as the previous caller did point out, regardless of how the early history was intended, the modern church is certainly connecting these dots. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Caller, your name again? Rob. Rob, have you received the second anointing? I most certainly have not. Okay. Sir. Most certainly. I don't know if I can trust that, Rob. I most certainly have not. He said it, Rob said it very strenuously, a little and too I strenuously, I think. I promise. Mo I most certainly. Not. Not. Yeah, okay. But he thinks the Rob doth protest too much. Hey, um, this, 
first of all, thanks for taking my call. It's By all means, yeah. With you guys. Glad you're on. Hey, um, I acquired a little book this last week um, by Russell M. Nelson. It's his autobiography um, called From Heart to Heart. He uh, published it in 1979. Spencer right. W. Kimball wrote the foreword to it. And uh, from his hospital room. Second anointing. And it, it would be like about 15 seconds or so to read it to you. Oh, please. Okay. It's on page 360. And he's running through the highlights of his uh, various years from 1960 to um, 1979. Including the flight of death. So this was 1974. And by the way, he, he's kept diaries ever since at least in college and he admits that throughout this so all his stories and stuff there they they were all written down you know and so they evolved over the years and stuff like that we know that you know their original source he had access to yeah so i don't know that we can you know claim that you know his his memory faulty memory adding details and right. stuff like that right but anyway uh, straight to the point um, yeah, read us that section. June 4th, he gets a call and says, President Spencer W. Kimball called me in to notify me that Dancil and I were to report to the temple on June 9th. And Dancil, of course, is his wife. Is that 1974? So he, he has that, I think, for other dates. We go down to June 9th, and it says... Dancil and I were privileged to enter the temple on this Sabbath day to attend a special meeting at the invitation of President Spencer W. Kimball. Oh. The, sac the sacred nature of this event precludes our mentioning more about it here other than to say that it did take place. But this experience is of the greatest importance to us and to our family. Damn. Thank you, caller. I appreciate that. That added some cool data to this conversation. He just couldn't resist. Can I give you just a five, sec five second blurb on a different page. Okay, really quick. Okay. He, he goes, these, and this is regards to um, him and President Kimball. He goes, these recollections are just abstractions of these choice experiences. Meetings of even deeper meaning we have had together, some of which are too sacred even to record here, where other eyes may view them. For I have been pledged by him to secrecy. Only Danfell knows of these experiences. Excuse me. Only Danfell knows of these experiences, having shared them with me. And that's on page 186 from Heart to Heart. Dang. Thank you very much, Rob. My pleasure. Have a great night, my friend. You too. Thank you. What a great, great contribution to the conversation by Rob. By the way, when he was talking about that June 9th, 1974, I did a little quick checking in the Wayback Machine. And guess what day of the week that was? Yeah, that was, I'm guessing, a Sabbath day. Sunday, June 9th, 1974. Mm. Look at that. That kind of confirms that whole Sunday thing. All right, and the whole thing about President Nelson, I mean, my gosh, he just couldn't resist. He couldn't. He had he to tell people. Shut the, the hell people. up. Yeah. I, I, I apologize. Let me put it nicer to you. President Nelson, zip the lip. Loose yeah. lips will sink second anointings. You should know that by now. But he does, he, he just has to say it. He's got to indicate, I had something super sacred happen at the temple on June 9th, 1974. I got the call from President Campbell. But by the way, he's not even waiting for someone to ask him, right? He's, just, he's, he's bringing the subject up himself. By the way, uh, too sacred to talk about. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> we should probably end on this note, right? Um, should we do this? And, and we'll call it a night. Absolutely. Everybody, thank you so much. Thank you for your donations. Thank you for listening. Thank you for everything. Yeah, it looks like, let me just double check here, the final amount here as we get to the end, 88.25. So we're about $1,700 uh, ahead oh of Oh my gosh, five. we are going to have a lot of pizza tonight in the after show party. Oh my goodness. You tell me about it. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me get rid of the comment here on, and we'll finish on this note. Have a great night, everybody. There's this idea that the church is hiding something that, which we would have to say as two apostles who have 
covered the world and know the history of the church and know the integrity of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve from the beginning of time, there has been no attempt on the part in any way of the church leaders trying to hide anything from anybody. Now we've had the Joseph.